four and a half years ago. Yeah, it was four and a half years ago, and there were a lot of steps. Um, I slowly stopped eating animals since the age of 12 when I was studying the Holocaust, and I recognized that uh, what was happening to the turkeys at Thanksgiving time, which was when I was studying the Holocaust, um, was eerily similar to what happened during the Holocaust. So I stopped eating turkeys then, and then it took another um, many years. When I was about 20, I learned about labor practices in the meat industry and fast food restaurants. And so I stopped eating um, cows and stopped eating fast food restaurants. And then over the next um, five years, I gradually learned more and more about how animals were treated. And um, I became a quote unquote pescatarian. And then uh, I visited a small family dairy to meet the cute cows with a boyfriend I once had. And I was eating an ice cream cone and petting a baby calf who had been separated from his mother. And I realized exactly how this process was working. And I became vegan right after that. We need to promote veganism is because of capital exploitation. I think that that is the root of all animal exploitation. And um, I think that this system perpetuated on the um, need to gain more and more money um, has led humans to do very egregious things to other humans and other animals. So the question of whether we can work within a capital system to become a vegan society and to save animal lives, the question is absolutely not, uh, in my opinion. Capitalism is, um, I think, is the main tool of patriarchy and it is the basis of oppression in our society and um, non-human animals are some of the most oppressed in our society and we learn ways to control them and to use them and I think that we'll continue to keep doing that as long as people um, are, are greedy and trying to get money in a system of capitalism. I don't think, I think one of the worst things for this movement is to try to get vegan options into restaurants in lieu of doing other activism. It placates people, it makes people okay with big restaurant chains, it makes people okay with and put their money into the very industries that drive the exploitation of other animals. Any tactic can be effective, it depends on um, it depends on actually what you're fighting. So I think that if you're in a community and you want to stop something and your local, um, your local city council will get behind you and make it stop, I say work with city council. Um, I think if you're combating someone who cannot, or an industry that can't have their mind changed with reason or knowledge, then um, protest actions and direct action tactics are completely acceptable. I think that um, we need to learn that all tactics should be on the table. The bigger our toolbox is, um, the more we can do. And some tools you, some tools are powerful and you don't want to use them very much. And some tools are very uh, weak and you don't want to give them more credit than is due to them. Um, so we need to just uh, learn widely, be open to anything, and then look at the problem at hand. Well, I think there's a lot of things that the movement is doing really well. I think that the recent onslaught of undercover videos is really great. Um, a recent survey by the Human Research Council found that this was the tactic embraced by, by social movements that has the most public support. And I think that the reason for that is because it allows people to actually see what is really going on. And I think that the brave people that go in and do investigations are to be lauded, and that's one of the best things that's going on. Um, I think that there's a lot of great things going on. The, the main problems are um, becoming placated by welfareism, becoming placated by um, small, bigger cages instead of empty cages, um, focusing too much on ballots where ballot measures aren't actually saving animals. They're just um, making their lives a little bit better and perhaps slowing the progress to animal liberation. Um, I think that the movement um, that fighting within the movement is doing the work of the oppressors. So I think that people whose focus is on liberation, um, not on welfare, but people whose focus is on liberation, should not be fighting with other liberationists. They should not be name calling. They should not be embracing the words that the oppressors use, like terrorists or violence, against the other people who are doing what they can to help animals. We all need to focus on our own game, figure out what we do best, keep working hard, and not insult each other. And I think that that is one of the the biggest dangers in the movement right now is that you have people who are focused on liberation fighting with other people who are focused on liberation and we're a minority and we need to support each other or at least not speak out against each other. I, I don't think it's ever okay for 
any social movement to embrace the oppression of another social movement. And um, in the um, animal liberation movement, there's uh, a sort of a bend towards embracing um, sexism in order to promote uh, animal rights or animal liberation, and I am opposed to this. Um, I'm not angry at the individuals who choose to engage in this, but I am um, annoyed with the corporations who put donation dollars to um, this sort of tactic because I feel that in the end all it does is reinforce the idea that it's okay to oppress other groups and that some groups are less valuable than others and if we live in a society that embraces the idea that oppression is okay animals can never be liberated and we will always have sexism racism heterosexism nationalism and all the other nasty things uh, that keep things like patriarchy and capitalism in place i think that what all activists should should be doing is working on a local level for local campaigns and communities that they understand really well. So it might just be that a big animal protection group is doing something of value that fights towards liberation in your community. So if, um, if that's the case, join the campaign. But I think the best thing to do is to find a local group uh, that can teach um, new activists the ropes and can work within the communities that they're in so that they can make sure that the sort of liberation they're fighting for is um, actually liberation and it's not welfare and it's not hurting others along the road. Oh, the rabbit rescues. Apparently Easter is a really good time to abandon rabbits. And so um, lately I've had um, the frustration but also the, the gift of meeting uh, this year four rabbits but around Easter three rabbits that have been abandoned and um, one was found in my alley and sadly um, a neighbor had just found another rabbit abandoned in a park uh, but luckily rabbits seem to be bonded so luckily those two were able to live with my neighbor and they're very happy together now and then I found two other um, wonderful rabbits um, outside my office and was able to um, catch them after some time and get the medical care and bring them into my home and it took me many months and I now found them um, a family that I think will be will take good care of them and they're being fostered for a couple weeks and I'm a little heartbroken because I miss them but um, my roommate's very allergic to hay which is what rabbits eat but uh, it's it's been a new side of activism for me actually because a lot of what I do is research and academic or um, behind a bullhorn in, in the streets and um, actually working one-on-one -on -one, um, helping individual animals has, has taught me a lot about what this, what this movement is about. We're focused on individual lives and we need to remember not to look at things in terms of numbers and groups because if we think of the animals we're saving as groups, we're, we have, we're thinking of them as herds basically, as those who exploit them think of them. And so, um, you know, all the work I've gone to to try to find these animals loving homes and to provide them love and um, to learn about them has really taught me about, you know, what this struggle is about.